Water is the liquid of life. In fact, water is essential for all living things to exist as we understand them on Earth. Today we're going to take a look at the properties of water and how aqueous solutions form because actually, in fact, most all chemistry for life happens in aqueous solutions. And so it's very important for us to understand um, these properties of water and solutions. So grab your notebooks and something to write with and let's get started. So the first thing is just kind of taking a look at water molecules, and we've actually seen these before. Um, and so here we have our water molecules, and so the red represents the oxygen, and then we see the hydrogens are represented by the white. And then between them, we see, remember, we have this polar molecule for water that has a slightly positive hydrogen N and slightly negative oxygen N. And so we see this Greek symbol sigma here representing the positive of one molecule and the negative of another. So now we have an intermolecular force, and this is what we call a hydrogen bond. And in fact, the hydrogen bond is really what's giving water its unique properties. And so it's the source of all of our water properties that really make water and life as we know it very interesting here on Earth. And so we have a couple different um, factors that, that I like to really focus on, on how these hydrogen bonds impact um, some properties that we see in water. And the first one is cohesion. And so that's where water sticks together. It sticks to itself. And so we see here in this diagram that these water molecules are sticking together um, with other water molecules due to hydrogen bonds. And when that happens, we see some pretty interesting things with water. We see surface tension, so we'll see water striders on, on maybe a pond or, or a, a puddle. And um, we see that there's a surface tension that happens. Water will bead up. Um, we also see low vapor pressure, and so um, water doesn't tend to evaporate very easily in comparison with some other things, because these hydrogen bonds are holding them together at the surface, um, it also doesn't want to let any of them evaporate off, any of those water molecules evaporate off. We also see very high boiling point um, relative to other liquids, and the reason why is because those hydrogen bonds are holding, again, those molecules together inside there, and they don't want to actually let go. And so we see there takes a lot of energy to break these hydrogen bonds in order to allow water to boil. And so that's actually pretty important. When they talk about um, global warming and raising the ocean temperatures, it actually takes a great deal of energy in order to raise the temperature of the ocean, which is a vast amount of water, by a degree Celsius, and we're seeing that that's actually increasing. Another property that's really important is adhesion. And adhesion, I think of adhesives, they stick to things, right? So adhesion is where water sticks to other substances that are either polar substances or charged substances. And so that's an important aspect as well. This is why we see the meniscus when we're looking in our graduated cylinders. And so both of these combined effects due to these hydrogen bondings really gives us some interesting things that happens that happen in life. So one that I think is really interesting is transpiration. And um, if you remember from biology, you looked at transpiration where actually water molecules will evaporate out and so we have to get water into the roots of the plants and then once they get into those structures they're going to actually travel up through a network of kind of hollowed out cells and they are going to use adhesion to stick to the sides of those cell walls in the secondary cells of the plant and then they're going to kind of stick there and so as they get up towards the top, they're going to evaporate out through little tiny openings here. And so as one water molecule leaves, it actually pulls all the other water molecules up with it. And this is how we're actually able to get water up through really, really tall trees um, like the sequoias and the redwood forests or, or other um, very tall trees, say in the rainforest and things like that. It kind of defies gravity just based on these properties of water, which is essential to plants. And um, plants are essential to the primary production in most ecosystems as well as algae algae that's already living in the water. So I think those are kind of interesting aspects. Let's take a look also at um, how the density of water um, 
in the liquid and in the solid form actually interact. So here we actually see, let me change my color, actually let's make this blue. Over here we see this is our liquid water, okay, and this is our solid water. And so in the liquid water, we see quite a bit of fluidity, which we would expect to see. But it just so happens that the hydrogen bonds, when we get into the solid water, they actually become rigid and they hold these at a very distinct um, point away from one another. And when that happens, we see that it kind of expands these molecules in the structure. And so we're going to have um, a larger amount of volume per... Um, unit of mass in compared to the the mass per volume over here so we see an increase which means that density of this substance actually decreases and so we see a lower density here and this is what allows um, for the floating of ice on water which is pretty darn essential for a lot of living things as well and so we want that ice to float because if you're something that lives in water um, you want to be able to, to live there. So we see things like icebergs floating, these huge ginormous pieces of ice that float. And if you are something that's living underneath the water, so this is not a picture of Manitou, but you can think of Manitou Pond, there's actually things that live in that water all winter long when it's frozen over, and most winters we see that it's frozen at some point, okay? And if you're something living in the water, that actually that ice layer provides protection, it provides some insulation, and you're still able to live within that pond system, and so that's pretty important for those organisms. So then we have to think about, well, what are solutions? And so we know that um, we have some components to our solutions. So we have something we call the solvent. In our particular case with um, aqueous solutions, which are solutions in water, these are going, the solvent is going to be the water. It's the dissolving agent. It's the thing that we have more of. And then the solute is the substance that's being dissolved. And so it's going to be in lower quantity. And these are all the different salts and sugars or whatever else, the minerals that we have that are in there. So if you're looking at salt water, it'd be sodium chloride that would be in the water. And so we have this process that solutions will form. So we have our water, we have whatever's going to dissolve in the water, and we have to get them mixed together. And on a particle level, and remember we like to look at the particle level, we see that um, these, these particles actually end up kind of forming in very unique ways. So the oxygen end, which we know of water is negative, slightly negative, it's going to surround the positive particle or the positive end of a molecule of the solute. So this is the solvent surrounding the solute, and it, we're going to see that opposite charge interaction. And the same goes if you have the hydrogen ends of water, which are positive, it's going to surround the negative particle or the negative end of a molecule. Um, and so we see this interaction occur. And this is just one example. And here you can actually see sodium, which is a positive particle that we have here. So we see our positive particle here in the middle. And we see the oxygens are here, and these are our hydrogens. And surrounding all of the, this particle here, we see oxygens all the way around it. And so we see an electrostatic interaction. And that's actually how those things dissolve into a solution, is by surrounding that opposite charge um, with your, your proper end of that water molecule, which is pretty interesting. All right. Oops, let me that. With solution um, formation, we also know that there's different rates at which we can form a solution. And so if we want to increase making a solution, you can kind of think of, I know in our house on Saturday morning, sometimes we'll make some orange juice. And so Sophie will help us make orange juice. And when she does that, she's going to stir it. That's going to help increase the rate. A lot of times the orange juice, we hit the frozen things, the frozen concentrate bottle or can from the freezer section, um, if we increase the temperature of that, we know that that's going to happen faster. You can think about um, different things that you would dissolve increasing the temperature. The other thing is to reduce the particle size. So as we have big chunks of that um, I, that concentrated frozen orange juice in there, a lot of times I'll chop up the little pieces or we'll try to break up the pieces into smaller pieces. That's going to increase the rate of that solution forming and allow us to be able to drink our orange juice with breakfast instead of with lunch or dinner. 
Um, and so with solubility, we see a couple different things. And a lot of times we think of those solids, okay? So we want to dissolve these things. With solids, we find that um, if they will dissolve, we call it soluble. And you might remember um, insoluble from before when we were covering some information with uh, precipitate reactions. Insoluble means that we form a precipitate sometimes. And so these are not dissolved in, in solution or in in water in our case. With liquids we actually have different terms so we call it miscible if it will dissolve so we can put two liquids together if they dissolve in one another we call it miscible and if they don't we call it immiscible. One thing that I think is really important to remember with these is that like dissolves like. So when it comes to water, water tends to dissolve so water will dissolve um, polar molecules because water itself is polar. It will also dissolve um, other things that are charged. And so we will see ionic substances that will, will do that as well because of the charges that happen. We also see that oil doesn't mix with water because oil is nonpolar. And so we see that nonpolar um, will only dissolve nonpolar. We've actually taken a look at that in lab before. And so that's something to kind of keep in mind as we're working through this stuff now. All right. So solution saturation. We have some interesting things that happen with solutions. And so one of them is that we oftentimes will have what we call a saturated solution. And this is where we put the maximum amount of, of solute that, it, that the solvent can hold. Okay, So we, we put in as much as it can hold. And so there's not any leftover particles. And you can kind of think of, um, I know my brother used to always make Kool-Aid with like two cups of sugar. I don't know whose parent lets them do that. But my mom obviously did. And there would be sugar left at the bottom of that. Well, that would be actually more than that solution could hold. So at the point where we would no longer see that sugar collecting at the bottom, it would be a saturated solution, right when the balance between those would be um, optimum. Okay. Wow. Um, for an unsaturated solution, we have less solute than the solution can hold. And so, you know, if you just wanted to maybe sweeten up your tea or something like that, you would just add a little bit of sugar to do that, but you wouldn't have a bunch of sugar at the bottom, and you probably could fit a little more in there. And then finally, we see supersaturated solutions where we can actually put more solute in than a solution normally can hold. And you might be asking yourself, how is that possible? How can we do that? Well, we have a couple interesting examples. Um, one of them is rock candy. And so if you've ever made rock candy, um, you actually end up just dumping more and more and more sugar into the solution and then you'll run a string or a stick in order to allow that to crystallize out afterwards. And the way that we get that much sugar to dissolve is usually we turn up the, the temperature quite a bit and we allow um, the temperature to help us dissolve more of that sugar in there. The same thing happens with some of my favorite things to visit. So if you've never been to Yellowstone or, or visited some really amazing hot springs, um, I love to go and look at these and there's tons of minerals that are actually collected and, and suspended in, in the solution. Um, but what we see is if you look on the outer edge here, we see that there's some crystallization that's forming. And so this um, hot spring here is hot and so it'll dissolve more of those minerals. But along the outside where it starts to cool, we'll actually see some, some crystallization of those things occurring there. And so that's one way that we can do that. Um, so we look at these different factors that increase solubility. So in solids, uh, we usually look at temperature, and we're going to kind of ignore liquids for right now. Pressure doesn't really affect solids, but gases are kind of interesting. So we can actually get gases to dissolve in solution in water as well. Um, and so with temperature, we actually see a decrease. Oops, let me go back just for a moment. We see a decrease when it comes to temperature. And so um, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. With pressure, we see an increase in increasing solubility as we increase pressure. So this is all about increasing solubility. So if we increase the pressure, we increase the amount of gases we can dissolve in a solution 
or in an aqueous solution. And if we decrease the temperature, we can increase the amount of gas that will dissolve. And so I have a couple examples here for you before we're done. Uh, the first one is a soda can. And so what happens is a soda actually has carbon dioxide that's dissolved in it. And it's pressurized. We keep that pressure on that. When we talk about um, soda or pop, whichever you want to call it, when we talk about it going flat, usually it's been open and some of those gases start to come out. We've released or we've reduced the pressure and that causes solubility to decrease. The other thing that we see is that with things like fish. So fish need lots of oxygen, especially our wonderful salmon. And so they need oxygen in the water. And what we see is that as the temperature um, is low, so if we see temperature is low, we see a lot of dissolved oxygen. And we see as we raise temperature, that we see a reduction in the dissolved oxygen. And that's not good for our, um, our salmon and our trout. And actually, even though this is a brook trout here, um, beautiful fish, not native to this area, but we still have them, um, they, they start to suffer a little bit. So we have warm water fish, um, things that can live actually with reduced amounts of oxygen. Um, but these guys actually have a really high metabolism and they need more oxygen. So we like to have them in colder water because there's more dissolved oxygen available for them. So I hope that helps you in kind of visualizing or having some examples to relate um, solubility and solutions and water to.